Hi, everyone, and welcome to The New Human Movement. Today, Gary and I are delighted to be in conversation with John Ferriola, the former chairman and CEO of Nucor Steel. And John spent nearly 30 years at Nucor and began his career there as a maintenance and engineering manager in the company's Jewett, uh, Texas bar mill. He became CEO in 2013, and over his tenure as chief executive, Nucor uh, pressed its advantage as the largest, the most diversified, the lowest cost, and the most efficient steel maker in the US, siphoning sales away from competitors such as United States Steel and ArcelorMittal. And Nucor's annual sales uh, during John's tenure rose 30% and income more than quadrupled. And these are impressive numbers, uh, but they're kind of par for the course at Nucor. The company has in fact enjoyed a performance edge over the competition for decades. And the most significant aspect of this performance advantage, as I'm sure John will, will tell us, come from a unique organizational model that unleashes creativity and really encourages everyone to think and act like an owner. So John, thanks so much for being with us today. It's, it's a real pleasure to have you. Thank you, look forward to the discussion today. All right. You know, if I may jump in right away, I'm gonna jump in right away because I wanna make one comment. And, and I apologize, but I'll probably be doing that off and on during the day. Because I think that there's nuances in Nucor that are really important. And, you know, you talked about, you know, the leadership style, and, and, and that's, a, that's a function of our success. But it really is the culture of the company. Not, it's not something that's, you know, taught or ingrained. It's a culture. You hire the people that share that same culture, and you let them do their thing. So it becomes a culture, and it's been a culture, as you said, you know, since Ken began practicing uh, the leadership skills back in, you know, 1960. And Ken, Ken is Ken Iverson, who really uh, shaped the culture of Nucor back in the late seven, uh, late 60s, early 70s. And, 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 and the amazing thing about Nucor is that it's now, you know, has over $25 billion in, in sales, 26,000 uh, employees or in Nucor's parlance teammates. And, and the beauty about, about Nucor is that it has preserved that unique uh, uh, philosophy and culture, as you say, as it has grown, right? Which is very unusual. Typically companies might start that way, but then they, uh, you know, they become bureaucratic and hierarchical as, as they grow. So that's just an amazing example that shows that you know, these kinds of practices do, do apply to large scale companies. Um, so, so John, let me, maybe as, as we, just to get us situated, can you, maybe um, give our audience a uh, sense, maybe with some facts, figures, examples of just how unique Nucor's management model is relative to you know, its comp competition or any, fr frankly, any large you know, Fortune 500 company. You know, maybe talk about you know, the, the fact that you know, there are few layers or very few people at the head office or uh, the fact that the company's decentralized into little units. So you pick, pick whatever aspects you think are most relevant, but we'd love to just uh, uh, to have you give us a little bit of context. Well, just let me start with a caveat to say that I retired in, in uh, January of uh, 2020. So everything that I speak to will be at that point in time. Okay, And uh, I'm sure it hasn't changed. I know it hasn't changed, but I really can't speak to what it does, what it's like today. But let me talk about, because you touched upon some of the really important things. You know, number one, I think one of the most important things is the lean management we keep at our corporate headquarters. I don't know exactly what the number is now, but when I left, we had about 130, maybe 140 uh, uh, teammates in our corporate office. And at that time, we had about 25, 26,000 teammates in the field. And why that is so important is this. You know, you always talk about empowering your teammates, letting them make decisions, uh, letting them act on their own, letting them do their own research. Well, let me tell you, when you only got 130,000, 130 people in the corporate headquarters, and you got 26,000 people spread out over, I don't know, 230, 240 different facilities, you have no option but to do that, to let the team do their job. And that's why I always start with the number one thing you got to do is resist the temptation to build a corporate office and then fill it. Okay. Which, you know, there's no such thing as an empty office. In a, in a corporation. So, so we always made sure that we kept our offices small, uh, corporate headquarters small, and we only filled them with the absolute, you know, I, I used the philosophy, we always hired 
exactly the number of people that we needed to be effective and efficient and safe, and not one person more. And that was always the philosophy that we, we used when hiring at any level in the organization. So you mentioned a couple of things. Let me go back to some of them. But I wanted to point out that I think one of the most important is to make sure that you don't get top heavy. Force yourself to be lean and mean by not filling those jobs. Second thing you need to do, and you touched upon this also, minimal number of layers. You know, at New Corp, between the newest hire and the top executive level, we have four. In some areas, five because they're more specialized. But that's it. Four to five layers of management between the newest hire and the CEO and his executive team. And that's important because decisions can be made so quickly. You know, you don't have time in today's global economy and with the digital world that we live in today to say, you know, let's get a team together and I'm going to call my second in command who will call his second in command. We just don't have time to do that. So without the layers being there, it's, it's very quick communication. The other thing having very few layers do does for you is, enti- is enable your teammates on the floor to reach up and talk directly to the CEO. If they have an idea, you know, they'll call and talk to you. Uh, and, 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 and you mentioned about the importance of keeping the culture as, as the company grows and gets larger. And one of the key ways that we do that is our promotion from within. We, we, we will hire into the company at a certain level in the organization, usually at the manager level, sometimes at the supervisory level. Okay? Once we do that, everything beyond that is promoted from within the company. There's some rare exceptions, a very specialized need. You know, maybe legal or so, you know, something of those nature, of that nature. But as a general statement, you promote from within. And why that's important is the person who becomes the CEO, whose job it is to maintain and grow that culture, he lived in it. You know, you, know, you mentioned my background. I lived in that culture for 20 years before I was tasked with the, with the responsibility for maintaining and growing that, that culture in the organization. You know, so I think a couple of key points there to, to Hey, hey, John, can I take you back? Can I just take you back for a moment to your point about the head office and, and how lean that is? Because as I understand it, please correct me if I'm wrong, it's not only that there's a relatively small number of people there for a company of nuclear size, but you really haven't, you don't have a lot of the central functions, right? I mean, today in, in most large organizations, you have an alphabet soup of CXOs, right? And chief marketing officer and chief experience officer and chief technical officer. And then you'll have, you know, manufacturing center. And as I understand it, most of those uh, things have been have been pushed down into your whatever it is, 75, 80 operating divisions across the companies. Is that is that right? And, and what if so, what's the logic behind that? You know, it, it's absolutely correct. And it's again, it's a function of, you know, Part of it is simply the number of people you have in the corporate office. You you don't have people to do all these things. But I smile at you know at your titles of chief executive officer of this and some companies I'm sure have a chief chief executive officer of the chief executive offices. Okay, we we, we just don't do that. You know titles are not you know they're just not important. Yeah, you know, everyone uh, at Newcore knows the top leadership by name by first name. You know, you know most of them, if not all of them. You know, certainly a whole a great deal of them. So it's more of a relationship where it's a personal relationship. You know, I, I often use this expression and people roll their eyes when I say it, but it's true. That Nucor is much more of a family than it is a corporation. It's just, you know, the other thing that I say when I talk about Nucor is Nucor is the biggest small company in the world because that's what we are. We're a whole bunch of small companies underneath a certain umbrella. And the C word that you use, you know, centralization, we don't like that word, but we do love a C word. It's not centralization, it's cooperation, okay? We get the teams to work together, and that's where we get our strength. You know, uh, a simple example would be, and one of, one of my favorite ones, is how you buy a common material. In steel making, you know, we use electrodes in, in electric arc furnace. You know, basically, that's the thing that creates the stock that, stock that melts the steel. And you buy a lot of these things. You go through a whole lot of them, okay? And uh, instead of having each division buy their own, we recognize that there's, instru- there's strength 
and volume buying. So you would be tempted to say, let's have a central buyer. We'll buy electrodes for all of the divisions, all of our 21 electric arc furnaces or 22 electric arc furnaces. Okay? That's a temptation. The other approach that you can take is to say, let's get someone, let's find out who's one of our best melters, who utilizes technology the best to get the most efficient use of their electrodes, put him in charge of buying the electrodes to the corporation, create a team of people at each division. That's exactly what we did, right? And say, okay, the team gets together, the team decides what, how many we're gonna buy, who we're gonna buy them from, what we're gonna pay, and the team actually negotiates the deal with the supplier. At the end of the day, you know, obviously someone's got, you know, there's an executive that's got to sign off on it. You know, it's multi-millions of dollars of, of, uh, of an acquisition. So sooner or later we'll come to Charlotte for our approval. And the team will come up. It's done once a year. The team comes up and they make their pitch. They explain why they want to do what they want to do. And I can I, certainly during my time, both as an executive vice president, so over the course of maybe, um, I'm going to say 15 or 20 years of being at the executive level, we never reverse the team. It just, it just doesn't happen. Because how could I, as the CEO, say I know more about electrodes than the melter who is working with them every day and has been working with them every day for 10 years? It comes down to one of those things we talked about in the past. Giving the decision-making power to the person most qualified to make the decision. Now, what does it take to do that? Well, it takes leaders, CEOs, executive vice presidents, who are not worried about maintaining power. Because at the end of the day, when you give power to the teammate, okay, you know, we're talking about this guy, he might be a melter on the floor, and he's making this decision. And the CEO is saying, well, I'm not making that decision. Gary's making that decision. You're giving Gary some of your power. And you have to be comfortable with giving away power. You have to hire the right people in the management levels and management ranks who are not concerned with power and are willing to give power away for the, for the benefit and the efficiency of the corporation. You know, John, again, one thing to, I think, unpack there, because you said something I think that's like so important about uh, kind of collaboration or coordination versus centralization. And I think often the sense is, if, if we're going to exploit economies of scope uh, and of scale, whether that's in purchasing, whether it's combining our efforts to go after a new opportunity to serve a shared customer, the only way that can happen is if we have somebody at the top with the oversight who's who's seeing that and then, you know, pulling people together or issuing a mandate and making sure that coordination happens. What, what would seem to be the case, and maybe you can expand on this at Nucor, is for people to find those opportunities where we can we can work together to share value, you have to create a lot of connection, right? You have to create a lot of social capital that's running laterally across the organization. So people are finding others saying, hey, we can work on this together or we should be coordinating here rather than them looking up and, and, and waiting for something at the top. So what, what are some of the practical ways Nucor builds that, that connectivity across all of these different operating units, which are very independent, each with its own P&L? How do you make sure that they find those opportunities to exploit the synergies to scale where they exist? There's a couple of ways to do it. And, and, you know, you hit the nail on the head. You know, you have to have that social network, you know, not only so that people know what, what the common problems are, but to know what the skill levels of each individual at that level, you know, is. For example, going back to my electrode example, you have to have everyone who's going to buy into buying together saying, Gary's the guy to do this. I know Gary. Gary knows about electrodes. He's the guy. I trust. I trust his judgment. And if you don't have that, you're not going to work together as a, as a team. But how do you create this social network as you, as you refer to it? Number one thing that we do is make sure that everyone knows each other. How do you do that? Well, several times a year, we'll have all of the managers at a, a certain operation, whether it be maintenance or electric arc furnace control or rolling mills or one of our Volcraft divisions. We'll get them all together in a large meeting. Everyone at that same level doing the same job. A couple of times a year, they'll meet. You know, we never meet in Charlotte. I shouldn't say never. We rarely meet in Charlotte. Where we'll meet is at one of the plants. You know, I remember one time having the, uh, uh, making the decision to have the meeting in Charlotte, and I got so much feedback that said, 
No, why would we do that? We want to go see the mill in Darlington. Let's hold it down in Darlington. I've never visited that plant. Okay? So we move everything to the, to the divisions. So that's one way. Several times a year, you have meetings of people who are doing similar jobs, and three days they meet. Half of it's technical discussions. Half of it's, frankly, having a beer at the par par and getting to know each other and just talking about common problems, common solutions. Uh, another way that we do it is to make sure that our pay level is such, our pay system is such, that we reward everyone when the, when the corporation does better. At every level in our organization, we have profit sharing. Everyone knows if we find a way to do it better across all the divisions, even though each one has its own P&L, part of your bonus comes from the performance of that division, part of it comes from the performance of the corporation. And you always make sure it's important to have the right compensation system in terms of bonus. You need to have a bonus system that rewards people for what they have control over. Okay? So at every level of our organization and our executive vice presidents, they get paid on a corporate bonus. The general manager, managers of all of these individual plants get paid on a common bonus system. So they all have, a, 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 you know, they, they all have interest in making sure that the corporation as a whole performs. But the important point here is that at every level, even at our, you know, what, what others would refer to as blue collar positions, they're paid on a, uh, you know, on a corporate bonus through our profit sharing and through other things that we do. You know, our, uh, our special uh, bonus awards. When the corporation sets a record, it is a, you know, we'll hand out a one-time bonus of maybe a couple of thousand dollars and everybody gets it. You know, if you joined Nucor yesterday, and that bonus comes out today, you get that. Everyone gets it, except the executive team, because they're the ones determining how much it's going to be or wouldn't be right. So that, that's a couple of the ways. You know, it's, it's how you structure your pay system. It's making sure that you have meetings that are across the divisions in similar fields. And then the final way I would say that, and we do this all the time, we send teams to different plants. If we're having a problem at, you know, our Arkansas division, we might send a team of engineers from our Crawfordsville division down there to work with them and to work on this problem. That does a couple of things. Number one, team that you send down there, it's, it's, it's an intellectual stimulation for them, right? They get to see a different problem. They get to see a different mill. And they get to know the individuals, that their, their counterparts at that mill. So, you know, we, we call that, you know, field trips, right? But they're always with a purpose. We don't just send them there. And here's another point that I would want to make. Many, many companies make the mistake during the, whether it be during the pandemic or during slow, slow market times, they lay people off. Newcore, we don't lay people off. Okay? We cut back on hours. Okay? You know, we might, we might, since they're paid on quality tons, safety produced, there's less tons, the pay might be less, but they never get laid off. They keep their benefits. So what do we do with them during those times? If a mill is only running five, you know, 50% of the time, what do you do with the team the rest of the time? Well, we send them to one of the other mills, okay? Get to know the people in that mill, get to know the product, get to know the equipment, see how they deal with common problems in the steel making area. Bring ideas back with you. And uh, I will share with you one, one, something a mechanic told me one time, uh, a mechanic on a mill, a millwright mechanic. And I was talking to him, and he had just come back from one of these trips. And I said, what'd you learn? And he was telling me about it. And I said, boy, I said, you learned a couple of things. And he said, John, I have never gone on one of these trips and not brought back at least one good idea that we put into practice at this mill. Those are excellent. And there's so much to unpack. I don't know. Uh, but... Um... But just just on the best marking, is it true that these it's not just like one or two a year? It's thousands of these visits that happen across all the plants. So this happens all the time at a very large yes. scale. You know, and it's you know I can't give you a number because it's not set up by Charlotte. We don't say yeah. Okay, right. Here's you know the, the the supervisor running that crew, and it could be a crew of only three or four people. They might he might say you know what as a supervisor I just came back from the supervisor meeting, you know across country. Uh, company supervisor meeting, and I saw where well, they're doing great things in Arkansas. Let's go, guys. We've got a long weekend coming up. Let's go. And a lot of times these people, our teammates will want to go on their time off 
but if they don't miss work time, they'll say, hey, we'll go on the weekend. You know, because the way that our schedule works, we have a four-day weekend uh, uh, as part of the schedule rotation. So they'll do that. Uh, and, and that's it's, it's several reasons. Number one, they have a general interest in doing better. They have a genuine interest in learning more about other divisions. And they really care about the company because their owners in the company. Everybody's a part owner of a new corporate. But, but also, can I say, as I understand it, John, all of those teams, those frontline teams, also have a financial upside. When, when they borrow a new practice, when they improve their productivity, that shows up in their compensation beyond the, the profit sharing. Absolutely. Quality tons safely produced. So you go and visit a plant and you see something that, you know, Crawford's bill is doing that allows them to get a higher, you know, a ton per tons per hour by 2%. You, you know, these guys are so good at our bonus system. They'll come back and they say, boy, if we can achieve 2%, that's going to, that, that'll equate to $425 a month. I mean, they, they're that good with the system. They know how it is. And the key Which is, is also why they want to uh, buy the pool, uh, pool, um, their purchasing power on electrodes, right? Because it'd be, they, they actually, they see the benefit because they all have their own P&L, right? Absolutely. Um, can, can I ask you, John, um, and, and, and sorry if I interrupted you, but I, I think I'd like to get you maybe to talk about another example of where Nucor has essentially reinvented the way you, you know, the company achieves control. That is not through a big bureaucracy at the center, but by just leveraging these kind of peer-to-peer -peer interactions. Because I, when I was visiting, uh, I don't know if it was Charlotte or one of the plants that, that, that I visited, but they talked about how uh, safety audits happen, you know, and it doesn't happen through like commissars coming from HQ inspecting what's going on in each plant, but rather um, plants visiting sister plants and doing a peer review. Right. And, and they grade they grade each other. And you can imagine safety in a steel mill. It's like unbelievably important. Right. So it's a vital it's a vital function. And yet it doesn't happen the way most people would even conceive of, you know, getting compliance and safety, which is through some sort of centralized function. Because I, I, I can you can you expand on that and then we'll move on to other things. But I think it's so counterintuitive to most people that com control and compliance happens in a way that isn't reliant on a top-down kind of structure that I think it merits just having a, a, another example. Well, can, can I just can I just build on, on McKinney's point for one second and, and again, make this point of how weird, how strange this is? Because in most large organizations, to go to bed at night as a CEO and sleep safely, what you want to know is, I have a chief safety guy. They have a big staff at HO. They're issuing all these mandates. They're doing the monthly audits. That thing is back on my desk and I will never be surprised or caught out. And you know, you talked earlier about giving away power and trust. So how does that? How does that? The the the, the kind of peer accountability? Because 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 most leaders could hardly imagine kind of leaving that up to, to your frontline people. So, no no no. We we got to control this from the center. Otherwise, you know, something bad might happen. <laughs> it, it, that that's 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 reverse logic, in my opinion. Okay, and here's why. Okay, I hire you as a safety coordinator for the corporation. You come in and you've got a background. You, you're a graduate from some school that has safety, you know, safety and environmental training. Okay? You go into a steel mill. Are you going to be able to see the same things that I see having worked in a steel mill for 32 years? No. You're, going to see, you're not going to see the dangers that that person who's living it every day, he might even say to himself, hey, I see this situation developing. I got hurt seven years ago doing that. Okay, and he sees these opportunities. These are much clearer than somebody can uh, who's not living that life every day. And, and I want to share two points with you uh, as to why our team is so engaged in doing this. Number one, I said earlier that Nucor is more of a family than a corporation, and that's not just a saying. A lot of companies say that. That is not the case at Nucor. We know each other. We are each other's brothers and sisters. We care about each other. Okay? And we want to do this, these safety audits, not for the sake of you know, any, anything other than making sure that our teammates, our brothers, our sisters are working in the safest environment. Now, do we have compliance officers that make sure that all of the rules of OSHA you know, are followed? Of course we do. We have a couple of them. We don't have a whole lot of them. Okay? And do they go along on the audits? Of course they do. However, 
We, we make sure that we have the people who really know what's going on here. And just one more point. This is a minor point, but I have to say it. You know, you heard me say that our people are paid, our teammates are paid on quality tons safely produced. So if there's a safety infraction, even if it doesn't result in any injury, they don't get paid for those tons, which means there's a financial caveat to this. Now, that's not what's driving our teammates. I don't want to leave that impression at all. It's the fact that they care about their brothers and their sisters, family members. But, you know, the tacked on there, you know, whenever I tell people how our, our teammates paid, I say quality tons safely produced because that's really important. So, John, th the system you laid out works when there's an enormous amount of competence in the system that is distributed, right? And so people have the competence, the skills, the perspective to make the right decisions in, in this kind of a decentralized format. So can you talk to us a little bit about how Nucor um, builds this competence? And I think it's built, right? It's not like you're hiring the 1%, you know, out there that has these amazing skills. You, you develop it over the course of the long career. As you say, you know, people stay there for a long time and they don't get laid off. So can you just talk to us about how, you know, what Nucor does to just create this amazing level of, uh, of personal competence and professional competence? But I do have to say that it all begins with hiring the right people. Okay. You know, uh, you know, we always say that, uh, Dan D'Amico always coined this phrase that he says, you know, he says, you know, they talk about how many people do you have at this division? So we don't we don't really do it that way. We say this is we have the right number of people and we have the right people. So how do you get that? You start out with a very, very vigorous uh, hiring practice. And ours is tough. OK, I won't I won't remember the exact numbers, but I was involved when Hereford County on Millen Hereford County was just beginning. And there were several thousand people who applied. And we ended up hiring a couple of hundred. OK and the interview process and the testing process and the compatibility uh, uh, analysis that we do, you know, it's, it's rigorous. And that's at our entry level, okay? When you talk about when we hired a manager in the company, wherever that was, when I was CEO, and I can tell you Dan did the same thing before me, I'm sure it's still being done, but again, I don't know that, I'm not, I'm not there. But whenever we would hire a manager, which is, now here's a guy that's gonna be responsible for developing the culture and making sure that the skill competencies grow. I personally interviewed them. Obviously, they went through all the testing and the psychological profiling and all the things that we do. Okay, But then at the end of the day, the last thing that happened was I met with them. And I might only meet with them 10 or 15 minutes. But I want to make sure a couple of things, that I'm comfortable with the competency of the individual. The second thing I always wanted to make sure as a CEO or as an executive vice president, because we did this, at every level was that the new hire got to see me, got to know me, got to talk to me, became comfortable with me. So that if he saw something he wasn't comfortable with or that he thought needed to be changed, or he, he wasn't, you know, we, we, we say you had the right to call the CEO and everyone had my home phone number and my cell phone number, okay? And they weren't afraid to use it. Now, it was never abused, but it was used. My point being that when you meet the new coming teammate, need to make sure that they're, that they're the right stuff. They have the right stuff. You also have to make sure that they're comfortable with you, comfortable enough that they can come and see you or they can call you and they can talk to you about issues. Did that answer the question? So that's, that, that was very helpful on, on, the, on the training, uh, sorry, on the hiring. And I, and I didn't mean to suggest you weren't selective. What I meant is that on, as far as technical competence, that doesn't really, you know, for entry level people, maybe it's a little different for specialists. But for frontline people, you're not hiring for, for, for technical aptitude. You're hiring more for, for attitude, for the ability to, right? Never. At any level, we never hire for technical competency, ever. Okay. I hope you're enjoying the conversation and there's a lot more to come. I just wanted to take a moment to thank Hire for supporting the work of the new human movement and underwriting the costs of producing this video. Our goal is to spur a revolution in leadership, organization, and work. And in that endeavor, Hire has been an extraordinarily reliable and inspiring partner. Now, back to our conversation. Before we go on, because I think McKaylee wanted to know a little bit more about how you develop the technical competence, but can I just go back? You know, you talked about being that selective and hiring, John. 
what are the two or three things you're looking for and, and how do you find them uh, in, in those individuals? You know, one of the things we say all the time is we hire for attitude, we train for aptitude. Okay, you hire the right guy, that or gal, woman, man who wants to learn, who has, you can tell, has a thirst for knowledge, who has the right stuff. And then you bring them into the organization. It's incumbent upon, we put them on crews. That crew, the bonus is paid as a whole. So how the crew performs, everyone in that crew gets paid. So you get a new member of that crew, it's incumbent upon me to make sure that they come up to speed as quickly as possible. And that might mean getting together on days off. That might mean meeting at the individual's house to go over uh, techniques and, and, and practices. Because if you're not performing at the top level, you're impacting my wallet, okay? And that doesn't last long, all right? If you're not willing to come up to speed and learn, you're not going to stay on that crew very long. Now, so that's that's a key part how it's done. Now, we also do formalized training. We have Steel University, we call it, where we actually take people in and we go through a program and they get the group, they get they work um, hand in hand with a VOTEC, with a uh, community college, and they come out with half a day spent on what would be traditional community college uh, technical programs and half of the day spent working in our mills with our most experienced electrician, millwright, hydraulic specialist, whatever the field might be. So they're getting from both sides at the same day, half of the school side technical learning, but also half of the day learning the practical side of it. And we, we do that quite often. Uh, by the way, you know, we have different levels at each of, you know, electricians A, B, and C, they get paid at different uh, hourly rates. You know, they, they are tested to get to make those moves. Who does the testing? The crew, the, who are the crew members or their supervisor? So it's incumbent upon them to, to, to learn. And there's a lot of um, um, rotation or cross training happening. So if you're like in the, the furnace and want to see what the uh, uh, you know, the, the rolling, you know, or the, uh, the casting, the caster team does that you can go and train there and you get paid for that training. And right. And, and over the course of your long career, you also tend to rotate between different departments. So, so you get a very yeah. complete picture of what the mill does and how yeah. it works. And so you're able then to, to see the big picture in, in a way that you wouldn't, if you were just narrowly focused on one thing, right? Right, John. And, and by the way, you know, usually that happens as a result of the teammate saying, you know, I've been in the melt shop for six years now. I'd like to go work in the rolling mill for a while. But if you have a teammate that's suddenly we realize he's been in the melt shop for nine years, okay, then we're going to have a conversation with him saying, you know, we really think you ought to try the mill for a while. I like it over here. I know you do. And you can come back, go over there, work for a year or two. And if you want to come back, you come back. But we, we, exactly, we explain that exactly as you just pointed out, having that more rounded knowledge brings value to everybody and impacts everybody's pocket. So uh, usually when you say that, they, they understand pretty quickly. And what's yeah. so, so can, can I, I, we're yeah. just making a, one more point because I think this is, this, this is something people should at least hear. I would say that nine out of time, 10 times, 90% of the time when we encourage, we never force, we encourage someone to go to another division or another part within the same division, they rarely go back. They very rarely go back. And I'll see them and I'll say, hey, wait a second. You've been here four years and I thought you were going back after, you know, after one year. Nah, I kind of got to like it. I got to know the people. I kind of like it. So yeah. it's a benefit Great. for the individual and for the company. Yeah, just one last question on competence. And again, you know, I'm, I'm honing in on this, John, because, you know, people may think that frontline blue collar jobs are just fairly simple and low skilled. And I just wanted them to appreciate how that is so untrue <laughs> at, at Nucor and, 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 and inspire them that this is possible, perhaps where they work. And, and it has to do with the, the kind of the level of commercial competence that the teams have. So it's not just about being good at making steel or rolling it or whatever, or shipping it out of the door efficiently, but it's also understanding the economics of the business and understanding what the, the customer wants, right? So can you talk a little bit about, because I remember one of the plants I visited, that return on assets numbers in the cafeteria and everybody knows, anybody knows what that means. And again, that's very unusual. So can you tell us a little bit about how, how, how the, you know, the 
how how teammates learn about you know co commercial and econ the economics of the of 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 the steel making process and maybe even like the line to line process where they go out and meet uh, the customer you know the people that take their steel and do and stamp it or or do other things with it. So let, let, let me let me talk a little bit about that. Okay, um, is there uh, you know the concept of understanding the business. We have a great little game that we play. It's called Dollars and Tons. And this is actually a board game that was developed by our, by our teammates. And it, it talks about you, you basically are the CEO of a, of a, a team, is a, a management team of a fictional company. And you compete against other teams building a steel mill and then running that steel mill. And then you run it for basically two days, this game. And then whoever makes the most money is the winner. Now, you know, it's kind of like, Monopoly for the steel industry, okay, <laughs> right? And, and you know, it sounds kind of funny, but we, we have meetings where we bring a whole bunch of people together and, and, and do this uh, and, have, and, and play these games. And I'll tell you what, these games get cutthroat, man. I mean, they are really into it. They really understand the nuances of it, you know. Uh, and, and so that's, that's a great way to, to learn. The second thing I want to point out, though, is this, because I think this is so important. The, the teammates visiting our customers are not simply from the commercial teams. We don't send a commercial teammate in to see a customer without having somebody with them. And I don't mean the uh, vice president of manufacturing or something like that. I mean Harry, the roller on mill number three, okay, who happens to be the mill that rolls the product you are buying. So that you can go in and say, you know, and these are, these, these are, no one can communicate. I'm going to use this phrase because I don't know how else to describe it in companies other than Nucor. When you have one of our teammates talking with a blue collar worker in one of the other companies who's a teammate there and they connect on the line, they don't sit in meetings and have these discussions. Our guys go out and they walk the line where our product is rolling and they'll ask them, hey, how's the product performing today? Uh, you know, I noticed they had a couple of rolls on the on the inventory from U.S. Steel. How does our product run compared to U.S. Steel's? There's one better? Why? In what way? Can we work with you? I mean, this is a guy, a role of saying this. Can we work with you with a couple? With, let me change the chemistries a little bit. And, and, and you know, we'll get the tea at a discount. And, you know, you can run and see if that's, I mean, this, this is a complete package. So the guy that's running the product, our teammates on the floor, okay, they understand the technical side of their business but they also understand the commercial side. And one, think about what happens. We send Harry out and he runs into Gary, you know, on that mill. They form a connection, right? You know, you, you, you have coffee together. You know how that goes, okay? You know, guy on the floor, the guy on the floor, it, it, there's a connection. That doesn't end when he leaves. Our teammates, you know, will say, a commercial guy will come in and say, we're losing some business with XYZ company. Anyone know Gary over at XYZ? Yeah, I've, I visited that plant two years ago. I remember Gary. I'll give him a call. Hey, Gary, what's going on? You know, so it comes down to this, and, and this is the way that I would describe it. Our guy on the floor, the guy that's the millwright, the guy that's the electrician, the guy that's running the mill, that's not his job. He's a businessman or woman running a small business in his area. He's got customers that he services. He's paid by how well his little company performs, okay? And he's responsible for that. He is responsible for that. And you know what? You know, you know, you hear people say, well, in the union, they'll, they'll never let that happen in the union. I say, give it a try, man, because the people love it. When you empower people, what a sense they have. When they, you know, I often tell the story. Well, I'll, let me finish the thought and I'll come back to it. But uh, when you empower them, you give them responsibility, you empower them, and you hold them accountable and responsible, but you, you can't hold people responsible if you don't give them the authority, right? That's the worst thing you can do is say to someone, you're not performing well. Yeah, well, I didn't get to pick the electrode that I'm using. It stinks, okay? So you empower them. You give them the responsibility and the authority, and then you hold them accountable, Okay. And I'm just going to, and, and you'd, be, you'd be amazed at the competition that develops. We have four crews, very cleverly named A, B, C, and D, okay? At every division, and they rotate, 
know, we work seven on, uh, you know, we, we work 12 hour turns. So, you know, for, for, for four days, you have two A and B crew. Next four days, you have C and D. The competition between them, you wouldn't believe. Okay. Now, remember that they'll compete to look the best, but they also share what they learn because they all gain money from it. <laughs> okay. So it's, you know, it's a lot of friendly competition, but not when it hits the pocketbook. Now we make sure everybody knows it. But one of my favorite stories is we put a new melt shop in North Fork, Nebraska, when I was the general manager there. And we just couldn't get it going up to where we thought it should be running at. And we tried all these different things we were looking at. Finally, I said, let me try something. Each morning, I would walk out there as a general manager, and I had a chalk, a piece of chalk. And on the floor, on, on the uh, foundation leading to the uh, main control room for that melt shop, I would write down the letter of the crew that had the highest productivity the day before. And then they were allowed the next day to erase it and put their number down if they had a higher level of productivity. Everybody's laughing. Everyone's smiling. Okay. You know how? It took about a month for us to get to where we were running at about 80% of the projected capacity of that melt shop to where we were running at about 110 percent. People like that, but they had they had the authority to do what they needed to do. And then, you know, they like to see the results. You know, John, what you're I mean, it's just fascinating what you're describing here, because I think, you know, in many organizations, we, we move decisions up to where we think people have competence. But those people don't necessarily have the context, as you were describing with the safety issue, right? They, they don't have that tacit information. They're not on the ground. And what it seems like Nucor has systematically done is it's it's moved competence down to people who have context, who are right there and, and involved in it. And 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 you've just systematically invested in building their skills through 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 teaching them, through through the games, uh, through cross training, through these visits, uh, through the best marking where they're learning, uh, through their through 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 visiting customers. Now, let me let me take a, a broader perspective on this for a moment, because one of the other things that I think has been a hallmark of Nucor is that you've really avoided layoffs. And uh, within the steel industry, I think layoffs have been a way a lot of your competitors have managed, you know, through the ups and downs of a cyclical industry. You guys have chosen another course. Can you talk a little bit about, about the logic of that? Well, look at the loyalty, okay? You know, I, I always smile when I would hear, and I'm not going to name any names, but some of our competitors uh, their CEO, I, I'd, I'd be at a conference somewhere and they'd be speaking and they'd say, our teammates, our employees are our most important asset. Except, of course, when business gets slow and we lay them off. Okay. How can you possibly say that? How can I look you in the face and say, you know what, Gary, you are my most important asset. I thank you for what you do for our company. You're a great guy. You're doing a great job. But, you know, you're not going to get paid and you're going to lose your health benefit. Now, I want to be clear. During downturns, productivity goes down, our tons are down, people are paid for quality tons, safely produced, so their paychecks go down. The people never forget that they didn't lose that all-important benefits, okay, the health benefits. I, I, I again, you know, I, I hate to always speak in terms of stories, but I was the general manager at our North Park, Nebraska plant during one of the really bad downturns. and. We kept everybody working, you know, and sometimes they had very so little to do at the mill. We sent them out to work in the community, okay, just to keep their hours up, okay? And I remember when I was CEO one time, uh, and I was visiting the plant in North Park, and I'm in a Walmart of all places, okay? I'm going down an aisle, this woman comes running up to me. Now, this is like 12 years later, and she says, John, John, how you doing? You know, I couldn't remember her name, and she introduced herself. I said, hey, it's great to see you. You know, everybody's doing well in the family. She said, yeah. I said, well, I'm on my way. I'm doing this. I got to run. She stopped and she said to me, John, I just want you to know, I never forget what Nucor did for us during that 2009 downturn. Everyone in my family lost their jobs. Everyone lost their benefits. My husband, he kept his benefits, and that really helped us during that time. So people remember that. You want to talk about building trust in an organization? How do you think you do it? You know, we're with you during the good times. You know, we expect you to be with us during the good times. But during the bad times, hey, good luck, buddy. You're on your own. So, you know, there's a, there's a, um, you know, I, I hate to keep going back to this, but it's also a family element like I keep going back to. You know, you take care of your brothers and your sisters. You know, 
uh, I'm a, obviously Ferriola, it's Italian, right? And I equate Duco a lot to an Italian family. You know, we get together at Thanksgiving. I mean, there's arguing, there's back and forth, there's competition, okay? You know, but we walk out that door, anybody attacks the Nucor family, they're attacking everyone in the Nucor family. And, that, and that's, I mean, really, that's an Italian family. And that's what Nucor does. You have this friendly competition inside, okay? But they always come back to the fact that it's what's good for the family is good for everyone in the family. And they do that. So I, I, I just... Every time we have this discussion, I go away and it bothers me for three days because I just don't understand what is so complicated to understand about this. Let's come let's come to that for a moment, because, you know, what what you've done is you've systematically invested in the capability of your people in a dozen different ways. And 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 most of all, through downturns, when that has a real financial consequence. Now, when, you, when, when we ask a lot of leaders and, and business thinkers, like, why don't more companies do this? They say, you know, the, the, the first thing is, well, you know, shareholders are just implacably short term. They have no patience for this. And, you know, it's all the shareholders fault. And, uh, you know, they're only interested in quarterly returns and, and they don't get this. And yet, Nucor is a publicly listed company. So how do you explain this to shareholders? And, and is that really... Is that a legitimate concern when the CEO says, well, we'd love to do what Nucor does, but we have these very demanding shareholders. They're not going to, you know, they expect us to treat labor as a variable cost. You know, they, they're they not going to understand us us making these kinds of investments in our people. How do you respond? I would tell the CEO who's facing those questions to tell the shareholder, hey, look at how Nucor's shares have been performing. Okay. We have a 30, 40 year history of outperforming the industry in terms of our returns. To the shareholders, okay? So listen, you might not understand everything Nucor is doing. I'm telling you as a shareholder, I'm a CEO of another company, but hey, it works. So let's give it a shot, you know, <laughs> give it a year. You know, the, the challenge I think isn't so much that. I, I hear them say that, but I believe it's a little bit of a false narrative. I think the real issue is this. It comes back to, you know what? I worked 30 years in this company. I am the CEO now. I'll be damned if I'm going to give some millwright the authority to make a decision that I've worked my whole life to, you know, I'm giving, it goes, you know, you talk about sharing power. You know, you're not really sharing power. You're giving power away as a CEO who empowers their teammates. All right. You have to be comfortable with that. You have to have a basic belief that that's in the best interest of you and your company. And, and, and this will come back to, and I hope you do at some point talk about, well, how do we, how do we build leaders who come into industry with this belief? You know, how, why, why is that not happening? Okay. And that, that's something we need to, I hope you discuss. Well, let's, let's talk about that for a moment because I'm guessing, you know, mostly you promote from within. And I know that, you know, if a leader at Nucor doesn't really have followership, if people aren't, that leader is not going to last very long. But I would guess, John, that if, if you were hiring leaders from outside, a lot of them are not going to fit with a new core culture. And that's why a lot of them don't work for new core. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, when you do a search for, you know, it, it's almost a joke, but uh, uh, at some of our divisions, it could take two or three or four months to hire a replacement supervisor. And it's not for want of trying. I mean, you know, they, they've interviewed 30, 40, 50 people, but they just don't have it. Okay. They don't have that ability. You have to be humble. You know, a, a great leader is, is a humble leader. You know, uh, Dan has an, had an expression that he used so often. And, and I mean, to me, it was just perfect. So I, 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 I used it myself, okay? And we always talked about our team lifting us on their shoulder. As a leader, you know, you lifted me on your shoulders, okay? You know, I didn't get up there. You know, you lifted me up there. And it's what you what you do and what you accomplish every day that allows me to be named Steelmaker of the Year three times, okay? And you can go back and look at every acceptance speech I've given, for every, every accolade or award that I've received. And the first thing I do when I'm in that meeting or in that conference, I ask every member of the Nucor family to stand, okay? I publicly thank them for what they do, and I demand that the audience applaud them. I said, let's have a round of applause my new core teammates. And if I don't get it, I'll keep asking for it. Okay. Until I get it. All right. It's a way of recognizing that I wasn't steel maker of the year. 
new core teammates created someone who represented them as steelmaker of the year. So it, it sounds like a small point, but it's really important. And don't think that the teammates don't remember that. Yeah, it, just John, a small, just a small point on 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 the layoffs, and then we can move on to to the topic you want to talk about as well. Uh, but the the irony is, you know, um, is that people don't. I think investors appreciate, but maybe other managers or in traditional companies don't appreciate the the that that a lot of the productivity advantage of a new core comes from having a no layoff policy. Let me just maybe provide a couple of 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 of, of ways in that in which that happens, and then you you can react to it. One is you know, there's an enormous amount of investment in automation. And the automation ideas come from empl- from the teammates because they don't feel like the machine is going to take their job, right? They get paid more, right? So so they're the first ones to say, let's this process is a kind of an ineffective process. Let's just make it more efficient, right? So number one. Number two, it's an encyclical industry. So the cycle eventually it goes up again. And Nucor comes in roaring into the market because it doesn't have to hire a bunch of people. And, and the people that have, were in the in the plants have been toying with different methods and process improvements and so on. So they have like new products, new, new processes, and they can c- come to market way faster than others. And then the last thing is, as you said, there's this deep commitment to the organization. So whenever there is, you need to take the extra the extra walk the extra mile for the for the organization or for your colleagues you do that because as you say you're like a family right and so and it's great to hear that investors uh appreciate that but i think most ceos and others just don't don't get it they're not taught it okay and they they don't have the they you know when you that ability to accept that humility and and share power it comes from one of two things. It either comes from you're inherently that way or you studied management when you were studying engineering and you learned about these different things and how successful they were. Okay, but you don't see that. I went to a great engineering school, Maritime Academy. It was great, fantastic. I learned a lot about electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, you know, uh, uh, nuclear engineering, all kinds of engineering. Ask me how many leadership or management courses I had. Zero. Ask me how many. But maybe John. Courses. Maybe John. That that was a good thing. Maybe because had you gone to uh, got an MBA, you would have uh, walked out of those uh, rooms with you know the top down management model that most companies yes. operate with. Yes, but but here's the here yes here's the point. The answer isn't don't teach it. The answer is teach it correctly. Okay, get people in the schools. Okay, high instead of hiring. I'm not looking to offend anybody here. Okay, but you know. Uh, you're running a, an engineering program or, or a business program at Harvard, okay? Once in a while, bring in a, you know, I'll just say John Smith instead of John Ferriola because I'm not campaigning for a job here, but bring somebody in who's experienced firsthand how it can be done because until people see that, with all due respect, all of the books in the world, you know, people read, I read your book, it's a great book. I read and I said, boy, this makes a lot of sense. I know this works. I lived it. Okay. But someone who didn't live it, it's going to be hard to make that jump. You know, I'm, I'm going to look at Gary and say, Gary, how long did you work on the floor at Nucor? Okay. You know, so I'm not, I'm not, my, my point here is this. It has to get down into the educational system. You know, I'm all for pushing STEM. You know, I just had this, my, my little granddaughters go to a, they're in pre-K. And, and, and kindergarten, and I had a talk with the, you know, the principal of that school, and I was talking about the importance of STEM. Okay, so don't mi- don't misunderstand me. It's important to have the engineering, the math, the you know, the, the the science. Okay, it's important to have those things and technology, but it has to be mated with leadership and business understanding. That's the powerful uh, combination, uh, and it's just it's not happening. It's not happening. And by the way. You know, in all fairness, Nucor is not the only company that, that has accomplished this. You know, now I, I always say that they're, they're sisters, okay? You know, companies like SDI, Steel Dynamics, you know, they, they've got the same kind of culture. I always say almost, okay? You know, it's a, it's a Nucor wannabe. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of kidding. There's good competition. I know those people. They're really good people. But they came from Nucor. That's how they learned, okay? There's other companies out there that, our offspring of, of people who have left New Court for whatever reason and began new companies or got, went to work for companies. 
that's how it has to happen. It's got to be taught. You know, someone like you said, coming out of management courses, I can tell you what, I've, you know, I went for my MBA. Okay, I did. Okay, and I recognize, oh, my God, this is not what this is not what leadership is all about. All right. And I stopped. I never finished it because it wasn't real. They were teaching the wrong things. And I would always get in trouble because I would argue these points. All right. And the professor would ultimately say, shut up. You're wrong. You know, you have to have a centralized team and you've got to have here's the typical eight divisions that you have. You know, a CEO must have at least seven, but no less than no less than seven, but no more than 15 direct reports. What are you talking about? You know, there's no set rules. All right. I'm sorry. I'll stop. No, but I think I think that's such a good point, John, because, you know, we've thought this as well. You know, why is it that management research and and management teaching were just kind of stuck? And I think the reason is virtually all these faculty, all these all these researchers, they've spent their whole time looking, researching at companies that fit that old kind of top down bureaucratic model. And, and And they just think like, you know, that's that's the way that's the way it is. And that's why, you know, we're talking to you. That's why we're trying to, to kind of share these other examples, because, you know, we, we, we have to see Nucor not as this aberration. Well, isn't that interesting? It would never work here. But a harbinger like, like, no, this is what's possible when you treat human beings as if they're real human beings. You know, one, one thing I, I in, in one of our earlier conversations, John, I'll never forget, you know, you said we, we see ourselves at Nucor as not building steel, but building people, which is intimately connected to building strong communities. and you know, I think there's a kind of elitism that, that Ken Iverson talked, you know, he compared it to kind of slavery. There's this kind of elitism that says, I've gone to business school. I I got this fast track up the pyramid and, you know, and I'm going to tell the people what to do uh, that, that, that makes you almost dismissive of, of folks on the front lines. And so, you know, you don't you don't invest in building their capabilities. You don't give them the chance to experiment. You you don't give them real discretion. You don't give them an upside. And then and then when they don't deliver much, you say, well, like, like we told you, right? They're just like they're low skilled. And I think you know our our listeners have heard heard McKaylee and I say this before, so I'll apologize. But you know, we think one of the worst possible things you can you can talk about is low skilled jobs because we don't we don't think there's any such thing we think there's a lot of low opportunity jobs where people don't have that chance to grow but there's no job that seems to us inherently low skilled you, you are absolutely correct and the key is to know that there's no low opportunity jobs either because if you're in a job that doesn't have a lot of responsibility and you do it extremely well and you take advantage of all of these things that Nucor and companies like Nucor offer you're not in that job very long, okay? And then you move into another job and you do it again and again and again. But I want to make a comment on your statement about why do they, why do these professors, these these uh, courses go to these mainstream companies, right, and follow that theme? And it's because it's where their comfort level is. That's what they studied when they were undergraduate students, right? So, they, you know, I can go talk to a, I'm not going to name any names, but a traditional top-down company as a management consultant because I'm comfortable with it. That's what I study. That's what I know. I go in and if I, if I tried to do it, they'd look at me like you're nuts. What do you mean you're going to do this? You're going to have. Only- I can tell you, there, there are not many consultants out there, in my view, that are brave enough to go into a CEO and say you need to go from eight levels to three or four. Right? That that or you that. Need to go, or you need to go from 600 people in your corporate headquarters. Okay, the 200. Yeah, exactly. So let's pick this up for a moment. So, you know, companies, you know, examples like Nucor, and we've shared some others, you know, we've we've talked to the deputy CEO at, at, at Svenska Handelsbank and the most consistently profitable bank in Europe. And there are a few other companies up, out there like this. And and year after year, they outperform. And year after year, they're, they're still kind of, you know, alone and unusual. And, and so do you have any thoughts on, you know, how do we pressurize the system or how do we how do we create the same kind of energy today we have around environmental responsibility or diversity? How do we create that 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 pressure to actually turn on all of this unused human capacity that sits in our organizations? What what should we be doing to kind of, you know, push push leaders in this way and and, and try to overcome the inertia of the familiar? There's, there's only one answer, honestly, and that and that's to educate it. 
you, you have to teach it. People have to learn it because to just go into a company, I don't want to name any names, but you know who they are in my industry and say, you know, we're going to go from 600 people in Charlotte and, and uh, wherever down to 150 or 200 people. We're going to go from eight levels to four. It's, it's almost impossible to accomplish it unless you have a base of knowledge and you're surrounded by other people who understand it. So it's got to be taught. It's got to leadership, management, business, okay, has to be part of the programs. You know, at least in, the, in manufacturing, most of the CEOs, the top uh, executives in companies come out of engineering schools, okay? You know, look at that, right? Hey, I've learned everything that I need to know about Ohm's Law, okay? But I'm not learning anything about people, okay? You know, and suddenly I'm the CEO. I don't need to know anything about Ohm's Law, okay? All right, I need to know about people. So let's focus more on the education side on helping the engineers, the technical people understand how to lead. And by the way, we never say manage. Okay. I think I've said this to you before. You manage cattle, you lead people. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yeah. You like that one? Huh? <laughs> manage cattle. Wait, wait, you manage cattle. You don't manage people. You lead people. Yeah. If you lead, if you having, having said that, there are a lot of people in organizations that we call leaders who really aren't leaders. They are managers. That's so. exactly right. Right. You know, manager of human resources. What? Any? How can you even answer the title? Yeah, John. John, I was wondering, you, and you alluded to this earlier. I mean, do you think that it would make sense to frame? you know, the adoption of practices like Nucor's and, and uh, of, of similar companies as a national competitive a competitiveness issue, right? You know, we're just using, you know, a small fraction of the capacity of people. Like what if, what could happen to manufacturing or even to the service industry if we just turned, switched on all this, all these brains and, and, and you know, what, what role does maybe public policy or, um, you know, the government have in, in kind of pushing things along in this direction, if you think it has any merit. Yes, I, I do. I absolutely do. Gary, you began uh, only and you stopped halfway through the, the quote that I like to use about we don't build products, we build people. People build good good people. We, we build good people. Good people build good families. Good families build good communities. Okay. Good communities build good economies and good economies build good countries. Okay. And I've said that to many politicians and, you know, they always sit back and they think about that and they say, you know, that makes a lot of sense, but then they're gone. Okay. You know, you know, a different administration or they get caught up in some other issue and, and they forget about it. And it's, you know, it, 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 it's, you know, you talked about, you know, some, some CEOs bend to the pressure of their shareholders and short-term thinking. Well, some politicians bend to that also. Okay. They understand this concept of, what we really need to do is to build good people. But I, you know, I, I'll tell, I, I'd go to my grave saying this. You get 10% of the manufacturing companies in the United States following these principles, only 10%, okay? Our GDP will jump. Nobody will be talking about China being a leader in manufacturing anymore. And we would reclaim what should be our proper place as a leader, as a country, leading manufacturing and innovation. Yeah, that seems... I'm going to run for president in, in 2024. We'll see how it works. <laughs> we'll, we'll vote for you, John. Hey, let's take it from the public policy. And I know we're, we're getting, uh, we're, we're kind of out of time here, but I want to take it from the kind of the highest level down to the most personal level. You told us a little anecdote uh, about the way you kind of build relational capital with your teammates at Nucor that had to do with the way you manage kind of the first conversation you have with somebody, the second. Do you remember that little, because I'd love you to share. It's such a practical tip that, that anybody, any, any leader can take and apply. It, it's, uh, and, I, and I share this with people. You know, I mentioned that I would spend time with every new manager who comes into the company. I, I share with them, I call it my three touch point of leadership, okay? Okay, well, I'm going to use you, Gary, as, as the new teammate. I'm walking around the plant. I meet you for the first time. How you doing? We talk entirely about you, your family, what football teams you like, what your kids' names are, what their sports, what they, what they enjoy. You know, tell me about all about you. Tell me about you. Tell me about you. Tell me about you. And I always carry the, these old-fashioned, these little 
IBM cards that fit perfectly into you. The old punch cards, remember? They fit perfectly into your shirt pocket or any kind of memo thing. And I walk around behind a column or somewhere where I can't be seen. I write down Gary, A, A, A crew on the mill, wife's name is this, children's names are this, boom, 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 all of these relevant facts. Back to my office, right? I study them because I might do 30 or 40 of them in a typical day. Next time I go out, I see Gary. I talk to him a little bit about his family, ask for his wife by name, ask about how his son is doing on that softball championship. We talked about did they win. Okay. Then I quickly turn to me, all about me, my wife's name, what I enjoy, my football team. And wait, you're an Eagles fan? Are you nuts? It's the Giants, man. They're the only team. Okay. You know, and, I, and I talk all about me, my grandchildren, my children. It's all about me. Okay. So in the first two points of content, I never talk about anything to do with the company, productivity, what his job is or what his responsibilities are. Okay? But I will say this, and every time I have any point of contact with any of our teams, the last thing I always say to them is, what can I do to help you do your job more effectively? That's the second to last thing, and the last thing is always work state. But going back to my third point, so now in the third point of contact, now I talk about the job, because I've built the emotional bank account. You know, we know each other. Now we, we've got, we're not friends, but we, we're, we're, we're acquaintances. We, we're comfortable with each other. Okay? Now I start talking to you. Gary, tell me what you do for us. Tell me how you bring value to new core. Help, help me understand how you make all of us more money. Okay? And then we'll talk about, well, you know, maybe there's, I have some ideas right away. Or maybe I'll say, you know what, Gary, I need to think about some of that stuff. I'll be around in two weeks. We'll talk more about this. But it's never, a, you know, it's not, the, we now have a relationship and work becomes part of that relationship. It's not about work and then trying to build a personal relationship out of a work relationship. So that's my three points of contact. I've used that from when I was a, a, a night shift supervisor to when I was all the way up to CEO. Well, John, it's, I mean, it is always like so illuminating uh, to talk to you, but more than that, it's inspiring because, you know, we, we see what's possible when you unleash that, that, that latent uh, capacity and when somebody truly is a, a servant leader. So, so we want to thank you for sharing that. I will just say, and this is our little advertisement, you know, we do have an entire, I think, chapter about Nucor and humanocracy. You can dig into many more of the specifics here. But it's a company worth studying in depth. So find anything you can about them. Uh, they've been covered in different ways and learn about it. T pick some part of that within your team, wherever you sit. What can I do to start to put this philosophy to work in my organization? Because as much as any organization out there, this is a blueprint for building the sort of organization that is fit for the future and fit for human beings. So John, huge uh, thank you on behalf of McKaylee and myself for sharing this. You are very welcome and good luck. Hey, and keep up the good fight because it's you're doing the right thing, well, you know, not only for the country, but for people. People enjoy work. You know, I always say 99.9% .9 of the people want to go home feeling like they've accomplished something and they've done a good job today. And if you empower them to have the opportunity to do that, you have a much happier and a much safer workforce and a stronger, more profitable company.